All righty. All right, everyone, thanks uh, so much for joining us tonight. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes to begin. Hey, tech. I begin in like two or three minutes. See if there's any stragglers. Oh, so while we wait, how's everyone doing tonight? Is, are people ready for the weekend? Ready for the weekend, ready for the holidays. Ready to learn all about numbers for an hour and a half. <laughs> you need to learn a bit about numbers. Totally ready for the weekend. 100%. Who still has to do Christmas shopping? 1.5 hours. Yeah, Tech, uh, we tried cutting out a lot of the fat that was going to be in this, but um, there's definitely so much information we want to go over. It's probably going to amount to one and a half, but we're recording this, so um, if you have to cut after an hour, we'll still be able to send you the recording at the end. Uh, just getting the worst. Man, you had me going. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for the weekend too. <laughs> Even though the weekends are pretty much the same as the week now with COVID. <laughs> All right. Can't say the C word on here, John. COVID. <laughs> the pandemic. The pandemic. There you go. <laughs> okay. All righty. Wait a few more minutes or you want to just hop right in? No, I'm going to start in one minute. As soon as that clock hits 8.03, <laughs> we have any stragglers, they can come in. <clears throat> All right, well, it is time. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, so much for joining us tonight on our underwriting case study called How to Underwrite a 102 Unit Property Without Being in the Market. Before we start, just wanted to take like two minutes to introduce myself to you all. So my name is John Stober. I graduated from the University of Maryland at College Park almost four years ago now, so I'm getting old. And I graduated with degrees in accounting and finance. And immediately after I graduated, I took a corporate job uh, where I still work in corporate finance. So, you know, numbers and spreadsheet, that's kind of like my realm of, I guess, expertise. And when I started looking to invest in apartments, which was about two years ago, I naturally gravitated toward underwriting because honestly, I thought I'd be a natural at it. And as I started looking at deals, I realized that my formal education, my work experience really didn't provide any sort of value. Um, it definitely helped me build the spreadsheets and our, the financial models we use, but just because you have an accounting degree doesn't mean you know how an apartment building operates. So it doesn't help you figure out like what rents are, how much rehab is going to cost, what expenses should be, things of that nature. And as I started learning to analyze deals, I realized that really the only way to learn how to do this is to practice and to practice, look at deals that other more experienced people have underwritten. I mean, that really helped my learning curve and having a really good tool helps. And if you can do this though, it's definitely possible to leverage your way into some of these larger deals. And that's exactly what happened to me this past summer. I was able to take this skill I developed and leverage my way into a 34 unit apartment deal with a couple of joint venture partners. And we're doing a 
pretty heavy reposition of that right now. But without further ado, I uh, wanted to get right in. Oh, and also before I forget, we're gonna do a Q&A at the end, but if you have questions as we do the presentation, drop them in the chat. I'm gonna be sharing my screen, so I'm probably not gonna see them, but Fritz will be monitoring those questions. And if it's something that's like really important that we need to answer right there, he'll let me know. And otherwise we're just gonna save it all to the end and hopefully I'll have answered it. So with that being said, I'm gonna share my screen. Fritz, can you give me hosting privileges or screen sharing privileges? Should be good, buddy. Thank you. Okay. And let's begin. After I get rid of all this crap on my screen. Okay. So this was a deal that me, Fritz, and a couple of other people were looking at back in the summer. We made an offer on it and we actually made it into best and final on this. And we were about to go forward with the deal and then something, you know, we ended up backing out. I'm going to get into that later in the presentation. But the first thing you should always ask for, and I'm sure this will be new to a lot of or this is not going to be new to a lot of you is, you know, whenever you get a deal, ask wherever you're getting it from for the T12, which stands for the trailing 12 months profit and loss statement. So it's just the annual income statement, the rent roll, and an offering memorandum. The offering memorandum may not be available if it's a true pocket listing because the broker won't have put it together, but you should still ask for one because there's some useful information in this. And what I'll start by doing is just looking through this offering memorandum for you know, any key information, what the property looks like, can I get an idea of what condition it's in. So here, you know, I can see from the outside, it looks like it's been pretty well maintained. Some of these can be Photoshopped though, so I don't take much stock in it if it looks good. But sometimes you can get a lot of information on the not so pretty parts like the roofs right here. These look a little bit old, so I'm definitely gonna keep an eye out on these and see if I need to budget for any repairs or replacements. You know, they got this map up here. If you wanna look at that, that's not too important. This is near, so we got a Starbucks close by, some banks and a Walmart. So area doesn't look too bad, but again, I don't take too much stock into that either. I'll do my own market research. So they got the unit makes. And it looks like they have the, the current rents that these are renting for and they don't have the utility or the mechanical setup. That's what I'll always look for in an OM is how are they billing their residents for utilities? You know, are the gas and the electric separately metered or is the landlord paying that? Same with the water. Is it, you know, do they have forced air? Is it aluminum wiring? What updates have they made? PVC plumbing, galvanized. You can find information like that in the property. And also like age built updates that they've made recently. That you're all gonna find just from like glancing through the OM. And then where I'm gonna spend the most time <coughs> is just combing through this T12 that they give you. This can take a, some time. So I've actually already done this. And I've just highlighted like the key things that I found and I'm going to go over them. Otherwise, you know, we could be on for an hour just going through the T12. Uh, and I'm going to start at the top. So this was something that they only gave this to us going through March, which is right when COVID hit, which is uh, frankly a red flag that they wouldn't give us financials. I think we were looking at this back in July and they couldn't produce anything in June or even May. But so going with what we have, you know, I'm gonna look at the income and see about how much are they generating per month? Are there any volatile swings? This actually looks pretty stable. In April of 2019, they brought in 61K and it's fluctuating between 61K, 50, about 52. And it's going up and down, but it's pretty stable. So it's honestly not too volatile, which tells me that this is like a pretty stable performing property maybe it has a stable tenant base i can get more information in the om regarding that <clears throat> and you can also figure get an idea of how much these units how much income they're collecting per 
unit. So on average, they're getting about 571 bucks a month in rent, which is pretty low. Then I'm gonna to go to the other income. What stood out to me was their pet fees. The first two months they were bringing in about, you know, 15, almost 1600 and then 1100 and then it dipped to like 320 and back up to almost 1400. Hey John, what percentage of monthly income swings are tolerable? I just wanted to ask that before you moved on down the list. It's not about what's tolerable. I'm just trying to figure out like what the story behind the property is. So if this were fluctuating between like 65K, 40K, like 60K, 40K again, I'm just gonna start asking more questions. Like why do you have such volatile rent swings? Are you you know, leasing out some of your units as short-term rentals. So maybe the residents are only staying for like 30 days and they're leaving. Are you signing a lot of month-to-month -month leases? Which if you are, I should see higher month-to-month -month lease income, but it doesn't look like they're doing any of that. So these just look like the most of their income is coming from stable long-term tenants. And they're probably just having like standard turnovers and maybe some evictions, which is why in some months it goes down. And then in other months, you know, it's going right back up. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, thank you. Okay. So like with the pet fee, just because it's been kind of like volatile, you know, for the first four months on average, they're bringing in almost $1,100. And then for these seven months, it drops to like 420 and then it goes back up to 1300. I'm just wondering again, if this is like just seasonal or cyclical or did they like enact some new policy in summer or maybe, you know, they got rid of their pet fees and then they brought it back in March because they realized we're missing out on a lot of income. I'm not sure, but that's something I want to figure out from the broker or the property manager or the seller. If I can get in touch with any of them, you know, why did, why did your pet fees go f down so sharply from August all the way through February and then they came back up. Uh, late fees, insufficient funds and transfer fees. These were all, you know, these are all just pretty standard fees. Looks like they brought in, they had a high month with transfer fees. Other than that, nothing to really note there. Highlighted the storage lock fee because this is like storage units and they're not bringing in a lot of money for this, but this is like a pretty high in demand amenity. And the fact that they are generating some income off of it is, tells me when I go tour the property, I want to keep an eye out, you know, are there extra spaces that I could potentially rent out or can I convert a space to create additional lockers, which could help me generate more income. Old debt, you know, they collected like $1,400 in, excuse me, in March. And this is just, you know, payments that tenants have fallen behind on. Things that really stood out the most to me though, were the pest control income and the trash income. So as you can see for the pest control, it's trending up for most of the year. And for the first, this is seven months, it's kind of flat, but it's around like four to $500. But come November, you know, it hits almost 600, then 643, 738, 760, set almost 774. So it's trending up and it's the same thing with their trash income where for six months of the year, kind of stable between four and $550. Then we hit a month with 827, then it drops down, but it starts trending back up. And so these are numbers, even though they brought in 60, almost 6,800 a year in trash or pest control income and almost 7,800 in trash income, if I'm gonna base my income off of the T3, then they're, I'm gonna get about $757 a month in pest control income, which would equate to almost $9,100 a year instead of 6,800. And for the trash income, it's almost $870 a month, which is almost $10,500. So these two together are currently bringing in about $19,500 a month. 
which is a lot more than $14,557 a month. I mean, it's about five, uh, $5,000. I mean, that's pretty good income, but if you take that $5,000 a year and divide it by a seven cap, you know, that's, that's $71,000 of additional equity to the property. So if you miss that and you just go in based off of the T12 OI, you're probably gonna underbid yourself when you underwrite this. So then I'm gonna go down to their expenses. Taxes, I don't pay too much attention to these because I'm gonna figure out how taxes are calculated in the market and I'm gonna come up with a new tax number it's the same thing with for insurance. When you buy a property, the insurance is usually going to change, whether because the price went up and the carrier the carrier has to cover more, or you're going to switch carriers. But here, they had this huge spike in July of 2019. You I mean they're paying like 1,260 bucks a month for insurance, and then it spikes up to 16,600, and then it drops all the way back down to 38.44. So the, what this had me wondering is, you know, did they file a claim and am I gonna have to tell, provide that information to my own you know, insurance broker, which could make my rates higher. And there is a story behind this where actually this property is nine buildings. And for like the past two years, their insurance was only covering five of them. And so they were essentially playing catch up and they had this huge lump sum payment for insurance. And then after that, their insurance rates went up to like $3,800 a month. But had I not seen the $16,000 payment, I wouldn't have known to ask that or look into it. And they got their management fee, which again, I'm gonna get my own numbers for that. So payroll, this is a huge line item to look out for when you're underwriting a deal, especially something that's 100 units like this. That's to the point where you're gonna be able to afford a full-time staff on the property. And I always wanna know like, how is it currently being staffed and how do I need to staff it moving forward? And so if I'm looking at this, you know, this property is in Arkansas, the cost of living and wages are lower than the national average. So if on average they're paying out $7,100 a month to their staff. That's like a two person staff. It's probably a full-time property manager who's handling all the leasing and just the daily administrative tasks and a maintenance person who's taking care of all the maintenance and doing all the turnovers. But they have these three months here where it looks like, you know, it's an extra three to $4,000 in expense. And it looks like they're literally bringing on an additional full-time worker, maybe from another property, to help them either with leasing or to do unit turns, or maybe they needed some help with the maintenance. And I wanna know, is this something that I'm going to be able to do going forward? You know, if I need additional manpower, am I gonna essentially be able to borrow an employee for a month? And because the property management company, this company is Trinity Property Management, they manage the 34 units that we have done in Little Rock. We were actually able to just ask them directly like what was happening. And they were literally doing that. They were bringing on an additional employee from another property to handle like unit turns and uh, leasing when they needed it. And that's, that was unique to this case. I think these owners also, you know, they had a portfolio of properties. So they were able to do that, which means I may not be able to do that going forward. I'm going to go through the repairs and maintenance. Here, I'm looking for a lot of like big ticket items. You know, are they spending a lot of money on like their plumbing, their HVACs, roof repairs? If they are, that tells me that I may need to just budget those into my rehab to get those expenses down. But if they are actually putting the money into CapEx instead of repairs and maintenance, you're probably not going to see that in this section because capital expenditures, it's called being below the line. It's below net operating income. And you don't have to report that on your statements. So that's going to be something you're, you're going to have to investigate the physical condition of the property during your due diligence period. 
but their repairs and maintenance, there wasn't a whole lot that stood out. Like pest control, I would consider this more of a contract service because you're gonna contract that out. Grounds maintenance, you know, this is like landscaping and taking care of the front. And they had a couple of expensive months, but there's a lot of grass to take care of at this property. They have a pool, which appears to be in pretty good condition. And then they have like the plumbing, the appliances, and the HVAC, but really no big expenses here at the property, which lines up with what the, the broker and the management company were telling us that it's a really well-maintained property. One thing that does stand out is the carpet cleaning. They're spending over $13,000 a year on the carpet cleaning. Well, if we're gonna go in and renovate units, we're probably gonna rip out a lot of the carpets and carpets and replace it with like vinyl plank glue down flooring. So may be able to reduce this or get rid of it entirely. And here that, you know, this is contract labor. So that's gonna go into contract services. So that's if you had to like contract out a painter, someone who's not on your full-time staff, that's where that's gonna fall. Hey and John, then, do you think yeah. that they have an increasing pest issue? Pastor wanted um, to know. It looks like it was trending up towards the end of the year, a little bit, some expensive months. It could, it looks like they're paying $218 a month. And then they probably had to do some treatments here and there, which is why they probably spent 1200 bucks a month. But like in Little Rock, we you know we have pest control too. And part of the contract is they have to come out to the property whenever there's a, an issue. But if they have to do something like fumigate it, then yeah, that's gonna cost more. I don't think they have too terrible of a pest issue just because on a 102 unit property, like you're gonna have some tenants that maybe have like bed bugs or roaches and you're just going to have to pay the pest control company to come out there and take care of that. So going from $200 on most months and having to pay like $1,200, 500 or 600, that's not too big of a concern for me. It's, I consider that immaterial, but if we had started maybe on like the six month, and it was going up every month, then yeah, I'd want to investigate that. But that's actually a good point because two of the last three months, you know, they did have to pay additional pest control problems. So um, that, you know, that's a really good point when you're doing your due diligence to, to check pest issues. And so then we're going to go to the utilities. So they're paying 12, about 12 grand a year for electric between their water and their sewer. Only nine grand, 10 grand for trash. So these utilities are super low. And the reason for that is because there's no gas on the property. The electric is separately metered. So we're only paying for the common areas. And the water is also separately metered, sub-metered, I think. So it's all being billed back to the tenants. Sorry, no, yeah, it's a, it's not sub-metered, it's just separately metered. So these utilities are extremely low. I mean, all in all, they're only paying $350 a year for utilities. And especially when you're looking at your water, they do have some volatile months so they may have had like a leak here got it patched there's another big spike here in their water and sanitation we could find out more if we were scoping the lines but it also could have just been you know in january maybe they didn't pay an invoice for their water and they they paid it twice in february when i had my old house up in baltimore the water billing was just weird where every three months my billing cycle was you know, first two months, 60 bucks, third month, third month, 90 bucks. And that's just how they build it. It didn't matter like what my usage was, but it's still a really low water bill for a 102 unit property. And there's not a lot of opportunity to reduce it through doing something like 
I guess uh, patching leaks in your pipes. And then cable and internet, this is all just for their, their office. If they had like a cable and an internet contract though, that wasn't just for their administrative use, I'd be looking up in the other income section to see if they are billing back their tenants for cable and internet. And if they're not, then I'd be comparing the rents to competitors in the market and trying to identify, are they able to charge a rental premium for offering cable and internet to their, their tenants? If you have a, a revenue sharing agreement with a cable contract, usually if you can get one of these deals, you give them exclusive advertising rights in your property. So like when a new tenant moves in, Comcast will be the only one in that property that's allowed to advertise them. Maybe when they sign a lease, like they're gonna get a brochure uh, for cable internet. Only Comcast is allowed to give them a brochure, at least from the property management company. And in exchange, you can have a revenue sharing agreement with them where maybe you're getting 50% of all the revenue Comcast gets from the property. Mm -hmm. If they don't have an agreement like that, they may also give you a lump sum payment up front. And if it's like a 10 year contract and you're buying it, the property in the third year of the contract, you're not gonna see that lump sum payment. So you can ask the broker or the seller who's ever you know, selling the property, was there a lump sum payment for this? And if there was a lump sum payment, you're buying it in year three out of year 10, you can negotiate 70% of that lump sum payment because you're stuck with that contract for the next seven years and they've already been paid for it. And these are just more administrative expenses. You know, they had their legal and accounting in here too. But this came out to $150 a year, which is pretty lean. I'll usually budget anywhere from like 150 to 200 dollars for GNA, and I'll have separate lines for legal and accounting. So that's the T12. And I'm going to use this to help me come up with my own pro forma. Then I'm going to go look at the rent roll and you know, see what are they renting the units for. I'm gonna look at the leases, when people moved in and when they expire. If there's a bunch of leases that were signed like within the last three to six months, that tells me that this property is gonna have higher turnover. But for this, it looks like there's a good mix you know, of like 2008, 2018. They have a couple move-ins, which isn't unusual. Yeah, so it looks like it's like, you know, they have a little, they have some more longer term tenants in here than they do new tenants, which also is, you know, you want to look at, are they re increasing the rents on these tenants? Because if they're not, that's your opportunity. And then I'm just going to look at the rental amounts too. So like for the three beds, they're getting 800 or around 800 for the twos. It's in the sixes. They got some twos up in the 720 range. And the ones were in like the five to 600 range. I'm gonna go over to my spreadsheet because it's just easier to read. So I've already done this where I went into the rent roll and I broke it up by one bed, one baths, the two bed, one baths, two bed, one and a half baths, the three twos. And then they half of their one bed, one baths had washer dryers and these over here did not. These three all have washer dryers. And I'm just like putting in the rental amounts that are in the rent roll. And then I'm taking the average. So like for the one bed, one baths so without the washer dryer, on average they're renting for 550 right now. And I've highlighted all of these cells like either red or green because these units right now are renting for 580, which is more than the property management company told me the market rates were. But like all these green units, they're either being charged for like a pet fee or they're on a month to month lease. Some of these units though, I mean, they're, they're renting for really high amounts. Like this one bed, one bath with a washer dryer is renting for 715, but the property, and it's not renovated. The property manager told me, 
you know, the one bed, one baths with washer dryers could rent for 630 without renovations. So that tells me there's potentially some upside in the rents at this property, but I'm not going to underwrite that because I didn't, I didn't have enough data to verify that. Yeah. Like if we don't do any work, we can get these up to $715. So I'll take the averages, which are down here. It's just an average of all the rents. If there's any vacant units, I excluded those because they will distort the average. And I'll just put them right here in the in-place rents. And then my property management company gave me this list of up here in the top, they're telling me these are what the units can rent for without any renovations. So for the one bed, one baths without a washer dryer, it's 570. 650 for the two ones, 730 for the two one and a half, 830 for the three twos, and 630 for the one bed, one bath with washer dryer. Super critical is the additional charges of $10 a month for trash and $10 a month for pest control. I mean, that is like such great information because if I go back to my T12, which I transferred from what they gave me to the spreadsheet. I can see right now for the year, we were on average billing the tenants $12.10 for trash, pest, and utilities, which makes sense though, because if we go back to the T12, it started to increase in October and November. What this tells me is as they were signing new leases, they were starting to add income for pest control and utilities and things of that nature. And they still haven't added these charges onto all of their leases. Like even if we just take the best two months, you know, 733, 773, that's basically the same number we have. And then if we take 975, Eleven thousand seven hundred eleven. So it looks like in the last month they've basically gotten all of the units billed back for the trash income. So moving forward, I'm not going to run with this fifteen thousand dollar rubs and submetering number. I'm going to run based off the T3 and I know that I can get this up to if I'm getting 20 bucks a month times 12 months a year times number of units. If I have all my units leased up, I should be getting an extra $10,000 a year just off of the rubs and the sub metering, which is a whole lot of equity I've added to the property. So going back, they, they give me these numbers. I've put them in here. So right now we have loss to lease if we don't do any renovations. And what loss to lease means is it's just the difference between the market rent of the units in the current condition and what they're currently renting for. So PM company tells me on these one ones with no washer dryers, we can get them up to 570 without doing any renovations. On average, we're getting 550. On some of these we're getting 580, but that's because we have those additional fees. So my loss to lease is $20. So what I wanna do is I wanna capture that loss to lease in time. And I'm not gonna be able to capture it all immediately as I take over because it's not like when you take over a property, all the leases are gonna expire. And even if they did, you don't wanna have an exodus of tenants. So for something this small, I'm going to say normally, if it's not COVID, I'm going to capture that loss to lease over a quarter or over one year, which is four quarters. Because it's COVID, I'm assuming no rental increases for an entire year, which is why I'm saying I'm going to capture this over eight. For the two ones, same thing. It's a small loss to lease. I'm going to capture it over eight quarters. As I hit the two one and a halves and three twos, <clears throat> they're bigger. 
So I'm at about nine and 10% loss to lease. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna capture these over probably two years, but because of COVID, I'm gonna say 12 months for that. Just being super conservative right now, especially because of COVID. And I, you know, I don't usually wanna say I'm gonna increase rents more than like 6% in a year just off of organic rent growth. If I'm renovating units, it's different. But for these, like, I don't want to deal with turnover just to get an extra couple percentage points on my rent growth. Now, if this were 30%, that's completely different. That's a lot of rent and I'm willing to do a turnover to get, if I were able to get like the $670 rent up to like 950, yeah, I'm going to do a turnover for that. For something this small, I'm keeping it at three years to capture the loss of lease, which would normally be two with COVID. And then for the one one with washer dryer, I'm gonna capture that over eight quarters. So I'm gonna go back to what my PM company told me. So up here, these rents, this is what we can get them to, uh, we can get the units to rent for with, with no work. So they gave me a list of upgrades they're making to their units right now. <clears throat> and then they said upgrades, upgrades they would recommend to increase the rent further. And they gave me this, this list down here. It's all pretty cosmetic, like installing new sliding glass doors, new flooring, paint, uh, brush nickel fixtures, like shower rods, very cheap, no, no heavy lifting, Oops, sorry. And with those upgrades, I think we could increase rents of, by around 30 to 40 bucks a month per floor plan on top of the new rents. So that's really good information. 30 to 40 bucks a month is a really low rental premium, but the way I'm gonna determine if I wanna do this or do these renovations is I'm gonna take 30 bucks. Just break this all out. 30 bucks, there's 12 months in a year. That gives me a $360 rental premium. If my reversion cap rate is a seven per, is at a seven percent, I have added did I get that right? I've added fifty one hundred forty three dollars in value. And my, my renovation to get those rental premiums is probably 4,000 bucks a unit. The most expensive thing is gonna be the flooring, then probably the paint and uh, the sliding doors, but there, were, there was no appliance package, which is probably like a thousand bucks. And knowing what I know with our current renovations, you know, our units are in much worse condition and we're renovating them for between five and $6,000 with appliance packages. So they told me they could do this for between three and $4,000 a unit. And just knowing, having worked with them, I think 4,000 is conservatively reasonable. So my return on investment with that is, Twenty nine percent, and that's with a thirty percent rental premium. If I get it up to forty, well, now it just went up to seventy one percent ROI. Even in this market, it's kind of tertiary. Seven percent cap rate. That's like the highest cap rate I saw something trade at in here. A lot of the comps I saw were trading at like high fives to mid six cap rates. So. Our best case scenario is if we get $40 a month rental premiums and our reversion cap ends up being a six, we're gonna add $8,000 in value to the property with a $4,000 rehab. So these are definitely renovations I wanna make. And that's per unit, right? Yep, per unit, good question. So I'm gonna add those to uh, my units for the one bed, one baths. I added 40 bucks. The three twos, we decided we were not gonna renovate these and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. For the two one and a halves and the two ones, sorry, for the two one and a halves, we just 
assume a thirty dollar rental premium. As you get higher up in rent, you know, you're gonna start competing with houses. And we didn't want to do that. If we increase the rent too high, people are gonna say, no, we're we're gonna go get a house. And you know, that's actually why we decided not to renovate the three twos because homes in this market rent from between like eight fifty and eleven hundred dollars. And we didn't want to be competing with a house. So we just said we're gonna keep it at eight thirty. For these one ones without washer dryers though, we have a much bigger rental premium because we were assuming that we were going to install hookups and install washer dryers in the units. So we gave them a bigger rehab budget, but instead of a $40 rental premium, it's a $100 rental premium. And so our rehab for those units was $7,000 instead of 3,500. And again, if we just do the math, Rental premium 100, rehab 7,000, 7% reversion cap. So we're gaining $17,000 in equity for a $7,000 rehab. So it's a humongous return on investment. And then for our other income, I'm just going off of the, what the PM company gave me for the rubs, which was 20 bucks a month. And in the T12, I had about $40,000 a year for the rest of the other income. And there was nothing in that, in that T12 I really wanted to change for the other income outside of these two. If I get in there and say, I can definitely add more storage lockers, then I could increase that. But everything else, even the late fees, you know, pretty standard and I'm, I'm not gonna change it. Same with pet fees. If I find out that I can increase them, then I'll do that. But with the information I have, I, I'm not gonna assume I can increase them. And then I'm gonna assume a 2% rental increase and 2% other income increase. And because this is more of a tertiary market outside of Little Rock, it's not super hot like in Atlanta or a Phoenix, but it's stable. Uh, my stabilized economic occupancy, I'm running at 88%, which I think is a really conservative. And then for my rental growth rates, because I said I'm not gonna increase my rents at all for a full year, I went into my growth assumptions tab and for the first year, I just overrode the 2% and I'm assuming a 0% rent growth for that entire first year. And it's the same thing with other income and my rubs, 0% growth. And then for the rubs, because it's COVID, even though I know that I can get it up to 20 bucks a month, per unit, which ends up being about $25,000 a year. My T3 rubs income, if I annualize it, was only, I think it was like $19,500. So if I take that, divide it by 102, and divide it by the number of months, it ends up only being about 16 bucks a month which means right now about 80% of our leases we're billing back for rubs. So I, that's what this utilization rate means. We're utilizing rubs on 80% of the units. So that's what we'll keep it at that rate for the first year. And then in the second year, we'll stagger it up. And in year three, we'll have it on all of our leases. So now we'll go down to our renovation schedule so entire first year, not doing any renovations, thanks to COVID. Had we done renovations the first year, you would want to go through the rent roll and determine oops, which leases are expiring or ending. And then as you do due diligence, you can hone in on this more, but you're gonna come up with a plan for which units you're gonna renew and which units you're gonna 
not renew to renovate. And you can put that up here in this expiring uh, lease section. Because we're not gonna renovate anything for a full year, I have no idea what the rent roll is gonna look like. So I'm just saying we're gonna renovate or we're gonna start renovations on eight units a month. I know the property management company's construction arm can handle that. Whether we're actually gonna be able to start eight units a month, that's a, that may not be the case. That may be a little aggressive because that's gonna be turning over almost the entire building over the course of a year. But I'm willing to roll, roll the dice on that because we're already saying we're not gonna renovate any units for the entire first year. And on our Little Rock property, we're already successfully renovating units for a rental premium. And I'm gonna say that those units are gonna be down for construction for four weeks. And it's gonna take another two weeks to lease them up. So each unit we take offline to renovate, it's gonna be vacant for six weeks. And the model will automatically calculate that vacancy for you right here. So you don't have to figure it out yourself. And as we start to bring those units online, it starts adding the income for you. So that way you don't just say, yep, I'm like day one of year two, we're gonna be generating almost $7,300 in rental premiums because we renovated all of our units, like it takes time. I mean, you have to go through your leases and remove tenants, do turnovers, renovate their units, and then actually lease them up to generate the premium. Like you don't just get it in one day. This just takes care of that for me automatically. And that is pretty much, you know, that's our income. And our effective rental income, we're bringing in 56K a month right now when we take over which is within the range of the effective rental income i mean we in march we end at 57k and in the first month we're saying we're going to be at 56k so it's right where i would expect it to be then we're going to go fill out our expense assumptions so a lot of these, well, most of these I got through working with the property management company for the advertising. I bumped it up a little bit. You know, they have, they're running about $9,500 a year for advertising, sales, and marketing. I just bumped that up to 10200 I wanted 100 bucks a unit a year. It's not, again, not a super hot market. So I'm going to have to spend some money on advertising to lease up the units. For their repairs and maintenance budget in the T12, they had contract services and turnover in these. I just broke these up. And if you add them all up together, I'm saying we're gonna spend 107K on R&M. They were at 112, but we're getting rid of a lot of those carpets. We're gonna be doing a decent amount of renovations on the building. I think we can get our repairs and maintenance budget down and if you look at this on a per unit per year basis we're going to spend between contract services repairs and maintenance and turnover we're still spending one thousand fifty dollars a year on those amounts which is a pretty big budget for a property that is in pretty decent shape g a i'm just running 150 bucks a unit a year Insurance, I got my own quote from my own insurance broker. He was saying 330 bucks a unit a year for insurance is good. For the legal and professional, normally I'll run this between 50 and 100 bucks a unit a year, but because it's COVID right now and the courts are backed up, I'm expecting there's gonna be a wave of evictions at the beginning of next year, as long as they don't extend the moratorium. So I have tr nearly tripled my legal and professional budget to account for that. And then in the following year, I reduce it by like 60% to a standard amount. Payroll, this is something I worked with the property management company with. So this, these owners, they were able to 
pull resources from other properties when they needed additional help. That's something we're not gonna have the luxury of doing. So our payroll is gonna go up. And for a 102 unit property, we're definitely gonna need that on-site manager. Their salary, they get paid about 20 bucks an hour here. And we're gonna need like a lead maintenance person. If I wanted someone with more certifications, it would probably be more expensive, but I, I don't wanna pay the money, frankly. I wanna pay an extra four bucks an hour for someone who's HVAC certified. I don't think we're gonna need it and we're gonna get the return on investment. And given our high repairs and maintenance budget, I'm willing to roll the dice on that. So our supervisor is getting paid 19 bucks an hour. <laughs> And for a property of this size, we're still going to need someone who can help him with turning over the units. It's called a make ready guy. So this is a guy who's going to go in there, help with some of the cleaning and do the painting. He's an unskilled worker. And down here, we can get someone for about 14 bucks an hour to do that. And he's only going to work part time. So I have a part time make ready guy for that. And then I'm going to assume 21% for FICA taxes and benefits. And so my payroll cost is going up by almost $18,000 a year. <coughs> taxes. So I did calculate my own property taxes and I have a little calculation over here where I take the assessed value, which in this market is 20% of market value, which is what the purchase price is. Then I know the millage rate here is almost 50. And I'll calculate that by taking the millage rate divided by a thousand, multiplied by the purchase price. And that actually gets me property taxes of 45K. So if I wanted to, I, I could reduce these property taxes probably to 51K because if I hire an appeals attorney, he's probably gonna take half of my savings. I'm just not confident that I'm right with that number <laughs> um, and I wanna be conservative. So I'm just assuming that the property taxes are gonna stay the same at this purchase price. And if we can reduce them, you know, that's additional upside for us, but I don't have enough information where I can say with certainty, we can reduce the property taxes. And then the turnover, I'm just running 200 bucks a unit a year. And utilities for the most part, I am keeping the same. Um, uh, one thing about the water and the sewer bill though. So it's really, really low. But remember, the tenants are the ones paying for the water bills right now, which means that's an additional cost incurred for them. So I was able to get some exterior pictures, or sorry, interior pictures of the units to learn like what types of toilets, faucets, and other fixtures that they're using for their water. And I get quotes from a water conservation company called Sustainability Solutions. And they're really easy to work with. If you send them pictures of what the interiors look like, they'll send you a quote where they'll estimate this is if you change out your fixtures and put in low flow devices, like the, like the devices up here. And they have pictures of toilets uh, right here. we can save about 2.6 million gallons of water every year and almost $30,000 on the water bill. And we can do all of that for about $42,000. Well, our water bill is about like, like $9,000. So we're not gonna be able to reduce it by $29,800. What we are gonna be able to do though, is if we go into the tenants units and we install these new devices, we're gonna be able to save them $29,800 a year, which ends up being $24 a month that they're gonna be saving. So I'm pretty confident that if we're saving them 24 bucks a month, 
we can increase their rents by 10 bucks a month. which also increases our post renovation number. And again, I'm just going to do the same calculation for a $10 rental premium. Oops, sorry, it's 10 times the number of units. So it's about $12,000 of additional income a year. For $42,000, we're adding almost $175,000 of equity to the property, 300% return. So sign me up for those renovations. And that's our operating expenses. And then I'm going to budget $250 a unit a year for CapEx. And then over here, I just have my expense growth assumptions. So the legal and professional I'm gonna have it come down a lot in year two because it's, it's just really high right now. Uh, I'm assuming next year it'll be high because of COVID. And for the insurance, I have a higher growth rate because insurance premiums are rising really rapidly around the country. So I bumped it up to 5% just to account for that. Then we go to our rehab. So I have the cost per units for the rehab. These one ones, these include the washer dryer hookup and install. That's why we're budgeting $7,000. For the bigger units, I have 4,000 and 4,500. The three twos we're not even renovating. And then for these smaller one bedrooms, I just budgeted 3,500 bucks. I have the water conservation right here. I'm just saying we're, we're budgeting $25,000 for exterior HVAC. They told us they're in pretty good condition, but we'll have to figure out more during due diligence. Still want some sort of contingency though for HVAC. There's a little bit of paint work I know that we're gonna have to do, but not too much. They told us $20,000 should be the trick. There's some window replacement that we had to do. Some repairs to the decks and the stairwells. And then I know there's probably gonna be some roof work just based off of those pictures and what they told us. It's not a very big lift though. So I'm only giving us a 10% contingency. I mean, I already have like an HVAC contingency in here. And then the management company is gonna charge 5% to manage the renovations. So we're coming in about $7,000 a unit total for the rehab, which is not bad. And lastly, we're gonna go over to our financing tab and fill out these assumptions. So this was gonna be a five-year hold. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna talk about how I backed into this price later. But we were looking at getting a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan on this. These are called agency loans. And we got a quote for 75% LTV at a 3.6% interest rate two years IO. They told us there was only gonna be a 1% fee, but I'm budgeting two just because I don't believe them. I think it's gonna be higher and I wanna make sure I don't get caught with my pants down. And a 30% amortization period. We were trying to get like about $5,000 a unit of CapEx rolled into it. And you can get that with, a, with some Freddie Mac loans. I just wasn't confident enough that we were going to get that. So I left it out of the analysis and if we could have gotten it, it just would have made our returns even better. But for the underwriting, I'm, I'm assuming that we're not going to get it. And if we don't, it's not going to kill the deal. And then for these loans, instead of refining out of them, they have, especially if you're refining early, they have really big prepayment penalties, which is the fee you have to pay the lender if you refinance early. But to compensate for that with Fannie and Freddie, you can get what's called a supplemental loan. And that it's, it means just that, it's like a second loan that you add on top of the first. And combined, they let you 
take out the supplemental up to 75% LTV of the new value. So I'm saying we're gonna get this supplemental loan in month 30, which is halfway through our hold period. Well, if we've increased the value by a lot due to these renovations, the property is gonna be worth more now. And so if we're getting a 75% supplemental loan at a seven cap, we're gonna be able to pull out a bunch of money. And here, as you can see, we're pulling out about 1.3 million at a seven cap. We still have really good DSCR. If we wanted to refi based off of DSCR, which stands for debt service coverage ratio, and what debt service coverage ratio is, it's just it's your net operating income over your debt service. So a 1.4 DSCR says we have 40% more net operating income than our debt services. Well, we can pull out 5.7 million. And then there's a debt yield test too, which basically says if the lender were to foreclose on this, their loan's gonna be for 5.15 million, given the current net operating income, they're still gonna be earning an 8.5% return. So it'll take the lowest of these three amounts and that's what your refi number is, which ends up being at a 7% cap rate. So we're pulling out $1.3 million of capital and we have about 47K in closing costs. So that's how we're gonna be financing this. And then I have $385,000 in working capital. These are just additional reserves that you're gonna go into the deal with. And at the time, Fannie and Freddie, I think we were gonna have to get nine months of principal and interest reserves, which would have been, let me get rid of the IO assumption. It would have been $186,000 of principal and interest payments. So nine months of that is So Fannie and Freddie were going to make us put in about $140,000 into an escrow account. But they allow you to get these back, I think after nine months of having a DSCR of over 1.2. For us, the day we take over, we have a DSCR in the like 2.5. So we could have gotten this right back at the nine month mark. So I'm saying, and just be conservative in the 15 month mark, I'm gonna give us an extra six month cushion. We're gonna return those reserves plus an extra $60,000 of capital to the investors. That way we don't have to wait till the very end of the project to return those. We're gonna charge a one and a half percent acquisition fee, which is one and a half percent of the purchase price for an attorney to draft up the PPM and write up our contracts. I budgeted 25K title fees. I have about $3,000. Fannie and Freddie will often make you put an entire year's worth of insurance into escrow. So I have 12 months of an annual insurance premium, 25% for prorated taxes, two months for tax escrow. These numbers are honestly just plugs. I'm just putting them in here so I have something there. I may not have to pay anything at all. And if I do have to pay something, it's accounted for. Then I have five grand allocated for the survey and the environmental property condition reports. Another 20 grand for sponsored due diligence. Between these three numbers, this is probably really, really conservative. Budgeting 30 grand for uh, due diligence, but they really don't have that big of an impact on your returns. And then we have the appraisal, the financing fees of 2% and transfer taxes, which uh, I just found out 
by researching how much transfer taxes are in Faulkner County, Arkansas. And then on top of all of that, I'm just sticking in $25,000 into miscellaneous fees in case something goes wrong. And I can do this because like, you can see for yourself, this has such a small impact on your returns. I'm gonna copy these over here. If I get rid of those miscellaneous costs, I mean, our average cash on cash goes up like one tenth of a percent. XIRR goes up three tenths of a percent and IRR goes up about three tenths of a percent. It's such a small impact that I'm gonna keep it in here. And if I don't need it, that's great. But if I do need that for some reason, I have it in my budget for the due diligence and to make sure I can close. So we have our financing. And then I'm just gonna say we're, we're gonna exit at a seven cap. I know that's the same cap rate that I'm saying we're gonna refi at, which is two and a half years earlier. Generally, you want your, re your cap rate to increase over time because the building is aging, but a 7% cap rate is already really conservative in this market. So I'm gonna keep that as it is. And now that we have our financing done, we can start to see what these returns will look like in our investor returns. So if this is a syndication, it's gonna be an 8% PREF. After the PREF is met, we're gonna split 80% of the income between the LPs, which are the limited partners and the general partners. If we return all the capital through a refinance, then we're gonna split the income 50-50. If there were any refinance proceeds past the initial equity, so if they put a million dollars in and we refinance and get 1.2 out, that's like $200,000 of what's called refinance profits. So the GPs are gonna take 20% of those profits, the LPs are gonna take 80%, and it's an 80-20 split of the sales profits with a one and a half percent asset management fee, which asset management fee, by the way, is just a percentage of the effective gross income that the general partnership team gets for running the day-to-day -day operations of the deal. And with that, you know, we're generating a 9% average cash on cash six, almost 17% XIRR, over 15% IRR. So the returns look pretty good. It's cash flowing right out of the gate, even with our really conservative assumptions of no rental increases for a year. And then even when we rent, we take a bunch of units offline in year two, it's still cash flowing. And then in year three, it jumps up a lot. In year four, it jumps up even more because we've refied out a bunch of equity between in the middle of year three. So we want, we could actually increase our price. You know, if we only need to hit a 15% XIRR and an 8% average cash on cash, we can go, let's see what happens if we do is, if we do 4.65 million. Hey John. Tanner wanted to know what's the difference between XIRR and IRR? XIRR? It, it's kind of like an IRR function that takes time into account. It's so like this is a monthly cash flow pro forma, and it's taking the total monthly distributions, and then it's taking these dates up here. And so you end up getting the numbers can be a little different when you start talking about a monthly distribution versus an annual distribution, which is why the numbers are a little bit different here. Whereas IRR is just taking the total annual distributions. And the reason I like XIRR better is because we're saying we're gonna do a refinance 
in the middle of month 30, or sorry, in month 30. So in year three, our cash flows are kind of distorted. And actually a better example is if I do a, a sale in the middle of the year. Let's say we're gonna sell it in the 54th month, which is in the middle of year four. Well, right now, this IRR calculation is looks really low because it's just taking the annual numbers. And in year five, we're missing six months of cash flow because we sold it in the middle of the year. We don't have these months of cash flow right here. And these monthly cash flows, they all roll up to the annual numbers. So if I go back to a 60 month hold period, keep, just keep this number in mind, it's 2.05 million. Now we're back to 60 months. Now it's 2.25 million. So it's like an extra $200,000. So I like XIRR just because I don't have to worry about if I'm refinancing in the middle of the year or selling in the middle of the year. And I think the fact that it's taking these distributions on a monthly basis as opposed to an annual basis, it's more accurate. So I tend to use that a little bit more, or I, I lean on it more heavily than IRR, but also it depends what your investors are doing and what they desire. So, I mean, our average cash on cash and our XIRR are looking, you know, these are decent. The IRR is not great if an investor is requiring like a 15 or 16% return. It doesn't quite meet that. <clears throat> the equity multiple is pretty low though at 1.68. It's nice, you know, five year hold. Something I heard from an, a passive investor is she's like, I want to see a 1.8 equity multiple for a five year hold. So for us, that means we either need to get different financing or we need to reduce the price. So if we were to, let's see what happens if we get the, the Freddie Mac construction loan, or the renovation loan, that'd be like an extra $5,000 a unit. So now that's $500,000 we don't have to raise. Uh, I'm not sure if the rate would have been higher on that or lower. Okay, but so if we were, if had we been able to get that, you know, now we're meeting the 1.8 equity multiple. IRR is over 16%, XIRR is over 17, and average cash on cash is nine. So if we could get that Freddie Mac loan, you know, it's starting to look really, really good. Conversely, let's say we weren't able to get the supplemental loan. We're still getting 8.9% average cash on cash. Wait, I think I didn't change something. Oh, okay. Okay, so now if we get rid of the refinance. So, all right, so actually, so here is our base assumptions with the supplemental loan. About 8.7% average cash on cash, 16% XRR, 14.5% IRR, well, if we don't get this supplemental loan, you know, we're still getting almost 8% average cash and cash, 14% XIRR, 13.5% IRR. I'm assuming we're gonna get this supplemental loan. So this is just kind of a form of stress testing, which, you know, I think it's actually pretty good. The fact that we're not getting our ideal financing situation, and it doesn't completely ruin the deal. Like that's, a, that's pretty good to see. Let's say, you know, the exit cap rate ends up being 8%. So XIRR is about 11%. We're still getting really good average cash on cash returns. And that's with 12% economic vacancy, 
no rental in, no rental increases in the first year and then we're having the full rehab in the year two so the cash on cash is good for a stress test 11 percent xirr is also pretty good the equity multiple is not great but we're still making money with these assumptions our break-even occupancy less than 65 percent right out of the gate it's decreasing it's decreasing and then even once we do our supplemental it never gets above it, it never even gets to 71 percent so 75 percent break-even occupancy i mean it, it's market specific too but for this market, I'm fine with having a 70% economic occupancy as, our, as my break-even mark. I know we can uh, we can stay occupied. It's 30 minutes outside of Little Rock. Little Rock is a state capital, so there's lots of stable government jobs there. There's universities, so I don't think this little suburb outside of it is going away anywhere anytime soon. Let's see like how much of an impact I can take to my rents. So I'll just reduce these all by 10%. Roughly 10%. So even if I reduce my rents by 10% as a stress test, we're still making money. I mean, we're not even losing money. Rents, in, in my experience, this is what's gonna impact your returns more than anything. You know, I call it a lever because if you change it a little bit, it can change your returns a lot. Changing your rents by 10%, that's a pretty big measure. And the fact that we're still making money, you know, these are all good signs that this is a, a good, stable deal. It's definitely not a home run by any means, but it's like a solid single or a double. So how are we doing in time? Okay. So we were about ready. I mean, we had made an offer on this and I think we could have had the deal if, if we had really aggressively pursued it. There were a couple things that ended up having us pull out of this though. And the first one was that they didn't give us the T12 past March. And again, that's when COVID hit. For all we know, their financials completely changed from March through July. I mean, their income legitimately could have fallen from $57,000 in March to like $45,000 and we were looking at the deal and we would have had no idea that was happening. Had that been the case, I mean, our returns would have changed I think, an, an extreme amount. I mean, we just did that stress test with 10% rents, a 10% rent reduction. Well, if we reduce it by $12,000 a month, that's, uh, that's over 20%. And the 12,000 bucks a month is just speculation, but still, that was just like a big, big red flag, not being able to get more updated financials. The other thing was this exit price assumption. Even though I think a 7% cap rate was pretty conservative for this market, we couldn't find any sales comps for this type of product. You know, like this was 80s product. We didn't have any data that showed this product could trade at 64K a door. And just without having that product, you know, we didn't want to go through with the deal. I mean, the cap rate's important, but you gotta look for both. You know, you have to have a reasonable exit cap rate. You don't wanna be the highest comp in the market though, either. Just like if you're flipping houses, like you don't wanna be the, be the highest comp when you're uh, analyzing a flip. So if the comps are going for like 55K a door, and it's like an 8.25% cap rate. Now our IRR is getting down in like the nine ten percent range, and that's not really a stress test. You know that could reasonably happen. So between those two factors, uh, we we stopped pursuing the deal, and we ended up not getting it under contract.
But that is the case study. So it's if you're still here, uh, thank you very much. It's time for Q and A. All righty. So we did answer a lot of questions um, throughout it. I'm on Facebook as well. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to, you know, comment some questions. Um, but you, you answered a lot of them throughout. Um, I think you uh, appreciate that, John. Um, so anybody, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time. Here, we got one now. He said, what price did we offer at the, um, I'm guessing at the end, because we did buy oh. up 100K. Uh, I think our offer was 4.55 million. So we kept it at that original one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did it cost you money to pull out of the deal? No, because we didn't have it under contract. So it, it's not like we had put up earnest money deposits. And we hadn't, I mean, we, we've been to Little Rock for other properties, but we didn't fly out there to go see this one. So we didn't spend any money on travel. How fast can you underrate a 100 units, giving all the information you need? I mean, combing through the T12 can take a while. So it probably takes me a couple of hours to do that. And then as you get closer and closer to closing the deal, even when you have it like under contract and you're doing due diligence, you're constantly changing your numbers because if we, had we locked it up, you know, we could have gone out to the market and maybe the roofs were in like much worse condition than we thought. And we're going to have to increase our rehab budget or we go out and we walk a bunch of comps and we're like, Hey, you know, we can actually get like, $750 for our one bedrooms as opposed to our two bedrooms. You're going to constantly be changing this. I mean, it's a, it's a moving target. And with the lenders too, until you've actually closed the loan, I mean, things can change. Okay. Another question we got from Lisa is if we were looking at this for a buy and hold, I'm guessing um, like a legacy property, weren't, weren't looking to exit. Would we have gone after this deal then? No, for and for a couple of reasons. One, <laughs> this uh, this deal required a two and a half million dollar raise, and if we weren't going to syndicate it, I, I don't think our group could raise this money. Even with the group we had at the time, we were like, <laughs> "How are we going to raise two and a half million dollars? That's a lot of money for us to go out and raise." So that alone probably would have scared us away from it. Uh, the other thing is, like personally, when I think of legacy properties. I want a property like this that's in good shape. You know, it's well maintained, it's steady, steady, reliable income. But I want it to be in a better market, like that's growing really quickly. I mean, I'm willing to pay a higher price in some market like Phoenix or Atlanta, Dallas or Florida. Because if I'm going to hold on to that for 10 or 20 years, I know that property is going to perform probably the entire time in that market. And then when I'm ready to finally sell, or if I want to refi and pull out equity, those markets appreciate a lot. So the returns that you're looking for, are they different as, as a legacy property? Like are you willing to take maybe a 6% cash on cash and a lower IRR projected? That's a good question. I probably wouldn't be willing to take a lower cash on cash. I'd be willing to take a lower IRR because the longer you hold, generally your IRR does tend to decrease. But if I'm going to hold it forever, then the cash on cash needs to be good. I'd probably look primarily at the average cash on cash if I were going to hold it for over 10 years and I wouldn't weigh my IRR as much. Okay. Uh, any more questions um, on Facebook looking right at that hour and 25 minute mark. So I think we stuck to that hour and a half. <laughs> Uh, how do brokers get comps? The deals are private, right? Well, I'm, 
I mean, like if you're in the, if you're in a market, you know, you're going to know when a property sells, it's a pretty small knit circle. So if you have a good relationship with a broker, they're going to know if the property down the street sold, they're going to know how much it sold for. They can get you those comps. A lot of them have access to tools like CoStar too. And so they can get you comps that way. And it's actually where we got comps for this property in Conway. It's just CoStar doesn't always have the best, most accurate data. And we weren't able to get a lot of comps. But, and think of it like this too, you know, just the fact that like the property management company that's managing our properties is also managing this one. That was a huge leg up for that. And it, it just kind of illustrates that it is a really small world. All righty. I think that's all the questions we got. Any more? Okay. I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope uh, you were able to get some value out of this. And if you haven't received it yet, you know, we're going to send over our ebook uh, along with our, our simple analyzing spreadsheet that comes with the registration and we'll send over this recording as well. Yep. And um, if anybody's interested in the model that John used tonight, um, we're also going to be putting information on that in the email. But yeah, with, without further ado, um, we're looking to host more of these. Um, if Boris keeps letting us in this group, thank you, Boris. Um, we, we hope to keep doing this again, um, hopefully once a month. But yeah, thank you guys for coming. Yep. Thanks, guys.